Yeah, hello guys. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. Uh, last treat, I hope it's going to be a treat for you. So I'm here to talk about the, the how to run mobile games as a business. There's a lot of false misconceptions about what the games are. You just, a lot of guys just get lucky. But I think we wanted to share our story, how a small team could really challenge the big boys and how we could reach against impossible odds to top crossing positions uh, with initially a team of 12 people. Um, our company's um, small giant was initially founded on this premise that, that small, highly motivated and experienced uh, teams can do gigantic things. Uh, given that you know, we can utilize the, the platforms, app stores in, in place, and there's a lot of technology to be leveraged. And um, before we go into the actual the subject matter of the presentation, I will say a few words about small giant so that you get a little bit of a sort of familiar how big this small thing of ours has, has grown. So we're currently uh, uh, an international team of 44 people based right here in Helsinki. Uh, as far as we know, we were the fastest growing company in the Nordics last year. Um, and to give you a little bit of scale of the numbers, so last year we did $33 million in revenue. And as of uh, last month, we, we were at 200, over $275 million run, revenue run rate. So averaging the last, last month and multiplying that by 365. And very importantly, we have been profitable uh, over a year now. Um, and the last financing round, which was mentioned here, that we did a $41 million secondary round with EQT Ventures of Sweden uh, in January, um, because we were already profitable, profitable at that time. Now, uh, so coming back to our story, that how a small, te small team was really able to challenge the big guys. And um, as, as with many other games companies, we started you know, with bright vision and you know, a lot of eagerness. And we created two casual games called uh, Odd Wings Escape and Rope Racers. And they were super beautiful. A lot of love and skill went into those games. But in hindsight, they really didn't have a chance at all to break into top, top 50, top 10, top one, cross, top one crossing positions. Because there were a lot of flaws in those games in terms of structural design, in terms of positioning mismatches, and various other things. But we, we really took it serious, because we, we had this like, urge that we want to do something really meaningfully big. And we said, you know, what does it take to actually create a game that would actually get us to top 50 crossing positions, as you know, our good friends at Rovio, as our good friends at Supercell had done? And, and being you know, like real fans, we basically roll up our sleeves and, and started uh, doing a lot of research and work. So basically, uh, on game design, uh, really went through basically 50 top games, down to the progressive mathematics of them, what, and what are the components of successful games, what are the components of not so successful games. We look at the market trends very carefully, that where, the, where the consumers or players are shifting. Um, and we also did a lot of prototyping, so to find the perfect, uh, perfect game. And one of the things that actually drove our, our development of Empires and Puzzles was this very simplistic uh, strategic insight that was like two and a half years ago, that, that casual and mid-core games, gamers are sort of starting to converge. And what does this mean? It's basically that, on the other hand, we have about a billion plus daily active users on casual games like Candy Crush or versions of Angry Birds or Gardenscapes, what have you. Uh, these games are incredibly fun and accessible. They're beautifully made. It's fun to play, easy to start playing them. Uh, whereas on the other hand, you have these guys. You have uh, these mid-core, advanced mid-core games like Summoner's War or Contest of Champions or back in the day, Game of War uh, from the US. And these games are very complicated, but they also have the depth and the structure to actually become a really deep hobbies for people. And they will uh, trigger a lot of engagement and also a lot of uh, monetization opportunities. But from our perspective, when we were looking at these games, we said, hang on a minute, why in the world are they so incredibly difficult to play for normal people? So the onboarding, in our opinion, was quite, quite flawed. Uh, and we said, hang on a minute, could we actually create a game that would actually bridge these two worlds, that we could actually start converting or offering a lot of casual advanced players a new way to start playing a game that would feel familiar, would be easy to get into, but would, would actually cater for very, very long engagement um, and sort of uh, uh, activity levels. And, and basically, our game team did an amazing job in creating this fantastic prototype of a uh, completely new type of mastery battling uh, and, and very clever insight of actually that 
no, for some reason, no one had actually used the combination of base building, a lot of hero collection, and the match tree in a core package. And that's what we started executing on, and, and, and it really catched fire very quickly after our initial test. And the result was really an accessible and deep role-playing game. Now, here's a little video. OK, that was the 30-second crash course into the world of empires and puzzles. But before going into the sort of the, the reasons on why, how we run uh, mobile games as a business, very quickly, some of the actual results. So we were chosen by Google Play as the uh, 2018 best breakthrough hit game of the year, which is like a massive recognition for our really, really small team. Uh, Apple has given us a lot of uh, attention by give, you know, game of the day and various other things. But we also won the prestigious Finnish Mobile Game Awards uh, also this year. But more importantly, you know, we've grown very steadily. Uh, we have about 4.5 million active, uh, monthly active users at the moment, very active user base, almost 40% uh, stickiness ratio, and about 1.6, 1.7 million uh, daily active users as we, as we speak. And these incredibly good KPIs have led to the fact that we actually not on, did not only get to top 50, but we've been top one position in 36 markets around the world and top 10 incredibly in 100 markets, which is, feels completely crazy you know, given our predicament about two years ago. We were a really, really small company just dreaming about these things. And obviously, you know, we still have China and Japan and Korea to conquer. We haven't launched a game there at all. And, and this, you know, this, uh, this game and the KPIs, the amount of users has led us to very very um, fast growth, and here's the quarterly revenue development for the company. Um, and we're going to do pretty massive uh, amounts of revenue uh, this year and also next year. Um, and very importantly, we are spending over $90 million in performance marketing to drive the game very profitably. And this is one of the key areas that I'm going to talk about in, in, in a second, that how, how is it possible, that what, what does it take to get to this position? OK, let's move on to the actual, what are the success factors of running games as a business? The first one is really important. It's the company culture. Because you know, as you know, all high-performing companies are really essentially a collection of really good individuals working together towards the same goal. And for us, we've had always this notion from the very beginning that you know, ultra-efficiency in everything that we do, meaning that, that we really try to avoid this communication overhead problem that which slows or kills companies, that there are not too many people discussing or giving opinions about one particular problem unless, unless the core team really needs that opinion. And this gives us, you know, it's, it's really meaningful for anyone. That everyone has a lot of responsibility, and they, they know that they can make, move on very quickly as needed. The second aspect of, of running this business is, is that you have to be really rigorous in decision making. You can have debate things about things too quickly, but make sure that you really focus your small efforts on, on the most impactful things in a given, sev given day or a given week. So you don't throw too many balls up in the same time, but you only have one or two balls which you're really executing quickly. And then uh, coming back to the next point, which is really about the speed and quality. So rather than theoreticizing about things and you know, ventilating about them, Let's get it done. Let's get it measured very quickly so we can see the results. Sometimes at the expense of quality. Because one of the cardinal sins in our first games is that we, we went to this bit of a uh, pixel polishing mode, which is completely non-productive. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. What matters is completely other things. And we, we really wanted to avoid this going forward. And then, uh, obviously, it's all about this constantly evolving, super competitive uh, uh, environment. You have to learn all the time. So analytics is our like, pumping heart. We, we measure everything. We analyze everything deeply. We even build our own analytic systems from the ground up just to make sure that they serve our needs. But we also learn from our players. We, we test all of the main features with you know, hundreds of beta testers around the world just to make sure that we don't do something stupid and they are, all of the glitches are ironed out with the top players. 
Uh, we also do a lot of active participation in, in community forums, and our developers and community people are discussing with top players about the future and but also the current issues and good things about the game. And a very important thing about the culture is that you know, we talk to each other. We have a really interesting mix of super talented young, young, young folks coming directly from university, coupled with you know, super heavyweights of the industry. And basically, it's, it's kind of incredible to see that wherever there's a good idea, no one really cares where the good idea comes from, whether that's from a junior guy who just joined two weeks ago or from a, for a more experienced guy. We are very quickly to change our way of working and practices is, if needed. And then the last point I can't stress enough. Um, you have to learn for your competitors. You have to deeply you know, understand why are they successful, why are they not successful, who, who are they, and where they're operating. And just having that sort of in the back of your head that you have to, it keeps, you, keeps you the pace and cadence, cadence uh, uh, very, very sort of high so that you understand what's, what's coming behind, behind you or what, what do you have in front of you. Now, the, the success of running a successful mobile games company, in my opinion, is something called what I call often mastering the company full stack. Um, and in our case, we really had to master all of the following areas. But let's start with the obvious one, the game design. So you obviously, if you're in the business of games, you need to have people who, who, who know how to make good games. You, what, what are the structures? How do you position the game? All that stuff. Then another obvious thing is that you need to be have really solid in, in the actual development of the game, the technology, the server side, and the client side, technology, and so forth. Uh, and then the third area is obvi another obvious one, creative design, the audiovisual thing, the storytelling, those kind of parts. And I would say that most of the games companies are relatively good at this. Maybe not so on game design, but the problem is that most young game companies, and <laughs> we also did that a little bit uh, in the early days, that a lot of folks think that this is the business of games. And it, they couldn't be further from the truth. Because if you don't have the next one, which is analytics, you have nothing. You have to deeply understand how the game works and how the conversion funnels before users got to the game in terms of user acquisition work. And, and, and basically, that, that leads to the dark arts of performance marketing. In, it is so incredibly competitive. Over 700 games are launched every single day. And just cut through the clutter, you have to be really good in performance marketing. You need to know that your cost per acquisition is going to be less than your lifetime value that you're going to extract from those users. And you have to have those mathematical equations uh, and systems in place to manage the you know, incredible complexity you have there. I will talk about that in a second. And that, that leads to another area, which is business modeling. So you have to be able to put the game, uh, the analytics, and the marketing piece into a sort of a model so that you can actually run it as a business. You know what are the levers to change and adapt and you know, to, to have a constant evolution as you go along. Because that then will in turn lead to financing. Because chances are that you're going to need a you know, decent amount of money to get the baby off the ground, even if you have really good numbers. Because virality in today's market is very, very difficult. And almost no one can sort of plan for it. Um, and that's why you better be prepared to have a solid model that you can actually you know, in, invest in the, into the growth. Then the two remaining areas are very important once you have taken the baby off the ground. It's life operations, which is about keeping the game fresh and fun and engaging every day, every week, in addition to the uh, normal feature uh, uh, delivery that you do, obviously. Uh, and then the last one is, of course, super important, which is community. Uh, support, community nurturing, and player support. This is a very important part because all of the successful games today are very social in nature, and you have to put a lot of effort and sort of best practices into this area as well. So this is the what we call the company full stack. And then now a few examples about each, each of these areas so that you understand what it does it mean in practice. And the first one is uh, the, the analytics piece, so where we really wanted to go to full flexibility and accuracy so that you know, instead of using third-party tools, we chose to actually build our own. And, and we, we honestly feel that you know, having this in-house analytics tool and, and a really data-focused culture is actually one of our competitive advantages. And here's an example of uh, a revenue distribution by lifetime spend. One of the dashboards that we use quite frequently is that we launch um, uh, one of the desirable monthly heroes with the premise that you know, it should resonate really well with the top, top spending 
uh, lifetime spenders. And, and as you can see, the dents there were exactly what we were hoping. They resonated and they really engaged with the, with the, uh, with the new, new characters. And other aspects, uh, other pieces of analysis that we do as an example is the you know, different kinds of spender segmentation analysis. We look at you know, how people behave, how they respond to offers, um, and also what kind of offers we do, sort of optimizing on price points and bundle packs that, and all, you know, which, which stage of their lifetime of players should we actually offer them something. And of course, looking at the, the player behavior inside the game so that we can optimize and find better features, better uh, offers or, or events uh, for them. Second area is feature development, which is pretty obvious. So this is an example of a feature that, that we launched in August. Very successful, huge feature. It took us a long time to test with players. Um, and basically, 270 new levels, new, new heroes, uh, re-engaging some of the old, old, old heroes from the game, and completely new sort of summoning mechanic, which has completely new price levels. But these are the kind of things that you know, come periodically. Uh, which are obviously super important because the net game should never stop. Then uh, another example is of, of the life operations point of view. These are the monthly monthly challenge events that we run. This is one of the one of the events which is you know, pirate themed, uh, and and the job of that is really to create this monthly spike of uh, excitement, if you like, and 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 basically offer also a new type of play experience. You know, having new unique new monsters, heroes, art, music, and so forth. Um, and then uh, moving on to the most expensive area of the business, I mentioned the, the 90 million sort of uh, marketing spend. And, and how do we optimize that? Because, you, you know, we better be sure that we know what we're doing, because otherwise we would run out of money, in, you know, very quickly. And I was literally super nervous when we started, you know, after the launch of the game, with the, you know, the first million went out of, from our bank account. I was literally super nervous. Oh, holy shit, that better come back. Uh, but, uh, but that happened. So, so basically, you know, so-called top of the funnel optimization is incredibly important here. So how do you actually optimize the click-through rates and the sort of the people getting, getting people to download your game from the App Store? So we do continuous uh, App Store optimization experiments using the Google Play Experiments tool and just, you know, having this data exercise going on every single day, every single week. Um, and then Moving on to the even more towards the top of the funnel, which is the creatives, uh, the video ads that we do. Uh, just to give you an example of the scale that our incredible fi only five-person team, which is running close to $100 million marketing budget, how clever these guys are. So we are actually having over 1,500 video ad versions that we run across all of our markets, across different networks, and just up against various you know, uh, targeting criteria on the market. Um, and, and to conclude this sort of a short session, I wanted to show you a couple of examples of the video ads uh, that we've done. The first one is really inspired by Tinder, uh, which we use to acquire female users uh, to our game. And um, uh, this is an in-house production from the team. Yeah, who wouldn't have a, uh, want to have a date with the monster, huh? OK, so this is one example. The other example is you know, when we are going after more mid-core gamer audiences, you know, more guy, guy thingy. So uh, here's another video that we did with one of our partners uh, to address uh, that particular target segment. Yeah, so it's a, a bit of a fake news, but you know, considering the game, but it works. Okay, so so basically, I just wanted to conclude here. Uh, 
so in, in, in our opinion, the, in the business of games is really man mastering the company full stack. And you really have to tick all of the boxes. And if you're a new team, you don't have to tick all of the boxes right away. Like in our, our, our case, you know, it was really the area of performance marketing and perhaps live ops, which were the ones that we were not very good at. We were, we were really decisive that we, we knew that we need to get right people. So we, we were super happy to find the best people on the planet to run that show for us and also develop the capability on live ops as well. But that's it from, from me. I thank you so much for listening. I'd be happy to answer any questions if you might have. Thank you.